This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Akshay Manchale. Today's topic is Cloud FinOps, and I have two guests with me, J.R. Stormont and Mike Fuller. J.R. is the executive director of the FinOps Foundation. He was formerly the co-founder of Cloudability, which was later acquired by Aptio. He continued to work as VP of Product and Engineering for a year post-acquisition and decided to pursue his passion of advancing the FinOps field as a full-time employee of the nonprofit Linux Foundation. He has worked closely with the largest cloud consumers in the world, helping them design strategies to optimize and analyze their cloud spend through technology, culture, and process. Mike is a principal engineer and has been working on cloud and FinOps at Atlassian for over 10 years. Mike's team of data engineers, analysts, and FinOps practitioners help Atlassian get the most value out of the money it spends on cloud. He holds nine AWS certifications and has presented at multiple AWS reInvent and AWS Summit events on topics that include security and cloud FinOps. Mike has served as a member of the FinOps Foundation Technical Advisory Council and is currently a member of its governing board. JR and Mike are both co-authors of the O'Reilly book, Cloud FinOps. JR, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you, great to be here. JR, maybe we'll start with you. To set the context for our episode, can you describe what is cloud FinOps, why it's important? Yeah, definitely. So FinOps is the practice of managing cloud spend. And specifically, we're talking about public cloud spend, big cloud providers, commonly AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. And because of their very, very variable nature, the highly variable nature of cloud spend, which is that it comes up, it comes down based on usage, right? You pay for what you use. And the fact that Distributed decisions are now happening about cloud spend where engineering teams can procure the resources they need instantly. They can scale up new resources. They can choose different services. Those things coming together really created a need for FinOps as a discipline, which is the practice of really um, understanding, allocating, and maximizing cloud spend for companies using it. And, and when we started talking about this a few years ago, FinOps was really limited to just you know a few set of smaller tech companies who were practicing it using cloud at scale. But now FinOps is practiced kind of by every major organization in the world you know, as, as cloud spend as a thing has become really ubiquitous and grown in the last, last few years. Great. In terms of differences with respect to companies that own their infrastructure, what's different in terms of running your business on the cloud? How does your mental or business models for finance change because of the cloud versus a traditional company that has its own infrastructure? Maybe Mike? Yeah, so I guess within the traditional you know, infrastructure space, you, you're kind of doing these large upfront purchases that you're depreciating over f- sort of a three or five year period. And the variation of the spend in the data center, you're not paying a different amount for your equipment each time that you run. So what's different? Um, so yeah, with your traditional data center, you're buying equipment upfront with a sort of a large ex- upfront expenditure, and then you're not paying different amounts for your infrastructure month by month. You're sort of depreciating that that equipment over a sort of a three or five year period, usually at sort of a fixed depreciation schedule. Within cloud, though, you're buying servers at a per second or even per per millisecond basis, which means that the amount that you're paying for your infrastructure varies all the time. And so the amount of compute that you're using this second versus the next second really does mean that the variation of spend is what drives a lot of the complexity. And so trying to apply a traditional financial model to cloud spend means that you're sort of waiting these long periods between looking at, at the dollars and a lot of variation happens in between those cycles. And so what FinOps is do, trying to do is really move you into that more real-time attention to how spend is, is happening within your organization and getting you away from those sort of slow cadence, consistent spend financial models that are traditionally being used in the data center. And what Mike hit on there in terms of real time, I should have introduced a bit in the first part, which is the really key thing and differentiator with you know cloud and, and FinOps as compared to other previous disciplines of managing technology is that maybe not technically real time, but very, very uh, hopefully close to it, a near real time approach of getting consistent 
data in terms of cloud spend back to those who are responsible for using the cloud spend so that they can use that near real time feedback to, to change their behavior. And that's really a key difference is that, you know, in cloud, when you start using something, you start paying for it. When you stop using something, you stop paying for it. And, and that is as a fundamental model uh, is, is very different than traditional approaches. I think the elasticity is really nice with the cloud where you can get things on demand. And as an engineer, what that enables me is to experiment more than I could previously with fixed infrastructure. So sometimes when I hear FinOps, maybe the discipline around financial spending seems like maybe there's more red tape that you have to navigate as an engineer to try something out. So can you talk about how it can enable or how it sustains innovation while not completely running loose with respect to spending and having some sort of a framework for that. Is that possible? Can you still innovate while also having a disciplined financial operating plan for the cloud? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think that the whole point of FinOps is to in- ensure that your company maintains that that freedom to innovate. If you look at, you know, we've got a a tightening sort of economic outlook at the moment. Companies are very going to be looking for ways to reduce spend. And by having a good FinOps culture, you're able to work out where where you're getting good value for the spend that's being made within an organization. And so by being able to sort of track the the benefits that you're getting from the dollars spent, you're able to then to use that that metric to sort of encourage further spending in areas of the for the business. And also, it's really about giving confidence to the back to the business that the the dollars being spent on innovation is returning back in business value. And so, what what we see happen without FinOps being in the in, in the picture is that the freedom to innovate kind of maybe gets a little bit too wild and you know wastage and and unoptimized infrastructures gets developed eventually it gets out of sync with what the business expects to be spending on cloud and then you end up with these like halt moments or pullback from cloud moments and that really stifles innovation so what we're trying to say is, is a little bit of finops consistently over time goes a long way to enable innovation to stay within the cloud space without letting it sort of go wild and the business to get out of sync or out of touch with what the cloud spend should be. In so, so it's really just finding that balance between the company feeling very confident with the spend it has going into the cloud space, enabling that innovation, but also making sure that the business feels confident that it's been spent well. And in a lot of ways, engineers are used to dealing with constraints, and this is just a new constraint that's introduced. And, and it can help accelerate innovation if you get to that place where Mike's referring to, where it's a efficiency metric, a constraint that's introduced at the beginning. So it could be part of design considerations where the innovation gets hindered, I think, is if it's introduced too late in the process or, or you're asking folks to, to re-engineer something to be more cost efficient when it wasn't a consideration early on. And so the big shift, one of the shifts we've seen in the last few years is the idea of cost being introduced earlier in the process so that... Essentially, it's enabling more cloud to happen and, and people thinking about cloud and cost more on the lines of what, what additional services, higher level innovation can you do in cloud that you can't do in traditional models, on-prem data centers, et cetera, because you can use different types of services, you can procure services more quickly. And I think you know the, the big shift we're, we're seeing very much in that aspect is engineers now have to consider cost as a new efficiency metric and, and therefore operate in a new model. Mm-hmm. There is definitely a cultural and an engineering mindset change, I think, that is required to get this right. I think that maybe the responsibility is shared among various different functions and businesses. So who is involved in cloud FinOps? Who are the people? What what kind of roles do different people have to play in a sound FinOps strategy? Yeah, there's really a big mix of people who are fond of, of saying that everyone is responsible for cloud costs. Everyone does FinOps, right? And so, yes, absolutely. We're starting with the engineers who are writing code and deploying resources. You also have, you know, they're now partners in finance teams who are struggling to understand how to allocate the cloud costs after they come in. They're struggling to understand how to forecast them. I was on a call this morning with some folks doing FinOps for government agencies and and they... (laughs) Their finance teams are asking them to do five-year forecasts on their cloud spend in a world where they're in the middle of migrations. They've got 2,000 engineers working across different services. It's almost impossible to do, right? So finance teams are thinking about this entirely different and have to be educated and learn and shift. Traditionally, you had procurement teams who had to go buy 
hardware for software engineers and operations people to use. Now they're no longer the gatekeepers of the hardware. They are trying to do deals with cloud providers, make commitments to cloud providers, buy commitment vehicles like reserved instances or savings plans or committed use discounts. So it's a complete change in how procurement people and sourcing people uh, need to operate. You get into product teams who have to start thinking about their cloud costs so they can understand how the profitability of their individual services and ultimately executives. This used to be just a problem for those people off to the side of the organization using a lot of cloud. Now, you know, cloud spend is, is raised up to the level of the CFO often because cloud spend is, you know, the largest variable cost for many organizations. And for a lot of the organizations in the FinOps Foundation, we're talking about like nine out of 10 of the, the Fortune 10 large organizations, you know, cloud is becoming one of the biggest expenses in the technology world after, after labor, right? After their people. And so really it, it has become this thing where it's really everybody's responsibility in the organization. You know, all that being said, across all those different groups, there does tend to be a centralized enablement team, a FinOps enablement team that is working to help all those other groups do that. So Mike, Mike what are you seeing? Yeah, I think that in addition to those, uh, we're starting to see other other personalities uh, that are coming out of like your, your TBMO and your ITSM teams, your SAM teams, they're, they're being cloud sort of enabled engineers to quickly and acquire licenses straight from the cloud service provider and, and sort of skip the standard sort of SAM teams that were there. And they're being, FinOps is able to bring that conversation back to those uh, traditional sort of teams with frameworks and extending out from that, we're seeing sustainability teams now integrating with their data and collaborating with FinOps teams to try to drive these like great green use of cloud and trying to bring the picture of not just cost efficiency, but sustainable use of cloud. So I think that we're having a lot of touch points from that, that central FinOps team where they can enable a lot of different areas of the business with the cloud spend and, and cloud billing data. Mm -hmm. If I start from a company that has some small footprint in the cloud, maybe they have a roadmap to have more in your book, you talk about the life cycle of FinOps. So maybe starting from that smallish company standpoint, can you give a broad overview of what this life cycle of FinOps uh, journey looks like? Life cycle of FinOps, which is around the phases, and I think we'll dig into those in a moment. When it comes to the, the growth of the FinOps team within an organization from a small business up to large, I think that that really, we call that like the adoption curve of, of FinOps. So you start from what we see happening, especially in the smaller cloud spend companies is what we call the virtual FinOps team. It's like maybe a, a few key people or maybe one or two people in the organization that, that see part of their day job being thinking about the FinOps related tasks. As, as the cloud spend footprint gets bigger or the complexity of the amount of teams using cloud within your organization grows, then that stops becoming sort of a side gig for someone in the organization, starts becoming very important to have someone there constantly thinking about and driving what, what FinOps looks like within your organization. So you start to see that FinOps practitioner role fully evolve into a dedicated role within the org. And then as you're really getting to the large scale, you know, especially when they're globally distributed teams and that you end up with these, you know, full full teams of FinOps members that are sort of distributed, different sort of capability sets. You know, so things that we see often are things like data engineers and analysts, the FinOps practitioner that are just, you know, really sort of focused in on the, the individual billing elements of, of cloud and collaborating with those finance partners and engineering partners. JR? Yeah, and I think we see it come from two waves. There's a bottoms up approach, which is very much, I know, Mike, that's how you started. So I was just talking to one of our members at who's a software engineer or SRE specifically, who started, you know, in that I, I see there's a problem here. I need I need to to go solve this. I want to help the organization get better. And and typically that life cycle starts there. And those teams work on putting in basic FinOps practices around visibility and allocation. But it doesn't really all come together until you get the combination of also a tops down executive support mandates that can come from the technology leader and ideally should because the CTO or CIO has the teams who are responsible for the cloud spend. But it also typically needs to be a partnership with the finance leaders we talked about who needs to help drive the importance of the overall company numbers and the budgets and the margins and, and those areas. But ultimately, I mean, where it's all it all heads to over time is really enabling, you know, more of that data driven decision making by all these teams that we talked about so they can make better decisions every day. And a big part of that really is is getting buy-in across the organization that, you know, cost is 
important. And I, I think that's kind of the journey we see folks go on. There's there's all the capabilities that lead up to good fed ops, right? There's visibility, there's allocation, there's usage optimization, rate optimization, but it really means that everyone needs to start thinking about it in a new way. So let's start with the initial part of the FinOps journey where you really want to understand what's happening in your organization, where you're spending the money. So how do you how do you get started with that? What what models do you have to understand the cloud spend and uh, to analyze where you're spending money, where you shouldn't be spending money? How do you get started on that journey? That then connects us to the, the FinOps lifecycle, which effectively we have sort of three phases of the FinOps lifecycle. There's the inform phase, which is, I like to sort of think about this as is putting the thumbnail on the map about where you are today. And then you have the, the optimized phase, which is really sort of figuring out what are those paths on the map that we could go down? Like where could we optimize what sort of to get to a better position as far as our cloud efficiency goes, what are those paths that are available to us? And then let's set some goals on which paths we want to take down, take ourselves down. And then on uh, operate phases, that's the actual driving down the journey, taking that, that pathway. We're going to put things into action, you know, look at automation, implement tools, AI, ML tools or automation tools or cloud, cloud vendors tooling in order for us to start to move towards that more cloud efficient world. And then we loop back around and go back to Inform to really check where we are. Are we, are we actually progressing down the pathway we expected to be? Has anything sort of thrown us off course, come up, you know, anomalous spend or unexpected extra items that have sort of thrown a spanner in the works and sort of taken us off path? And then we just continue this process of looping around for each of our individual FinOps capabilities in order to sort of measure where we are, set where we want to be, and then implement change to sort of head towards that pathway. The first thing in there, honestly, when that whole process is just starting to look, you asked about getting started, like just starting to look at the cloud spend data regularly. And the, one of the first things that companies see when they start to look at it is that it's not always clear what the money is going to. And it's not always clearly aligned against how the business is structured and how the business is doing reporting elsewhere. You know, hey, we've got these set of Amazon accounts or these set of Azure subscriptions and they were set up by an engineering team, you know, maybe when something was in a staging or development environment and now they're supporting some set of production spend too. And how do we start to tear apart, you know, bits of the infrastructure and make sure that we can show it back to the people who are using it to drive accountability, to drive that decision making. And so one of the first important steps of, of actually I think, doing FinOps is starting to get into a tagging strategy, an allocation strategy, an account strategy, something that that says let's let's agree that that this is how we're going to split out our cloud spend, so that we can then start to build on top of that to get the rest of the visibility we need. You know, before we even start to think about higher level functions like optimizing spend, before we get to you know way down the road to unit economics in those areas. And I think it, it comes up. I, I feel like a broken record, but we can't say enough. Like. You know, this whole practice is really not about spending less or saving money or optimizing spend. I, I mentioned earlier, I was on a call with this government group and they were pushing back saying, well, we're not really looking at right sizing or savings or any of these things. We really just need to charge back and show back. I mean, that's really that first stage that majority of people find themselves at, which is how do we understand the spend? How do we get visibility into it? And then as you grow, and you may have, as Mike was saying, you know, millisecond billing or per second billing across thousands or millions of resources, then how do we keep a, a solid policy and governance and strategy in place so that that spending as it scales uh, is still not controlled, right? Because we don't want to control and lock down spending to the earlier point of not hindering innovation, but that there's a, there's a strategy to keep it allocated and keep visibility in place as it gets to be really big. You mentioned chargeback and showbacks to understand what's happening with your cloud bill. So do you just get a large PDF with your spending maybe right now, but you want to like improve on that process? So can you describe how you improve on that process from just having one large account maybe and one bill to getting this chargeback or showback sort of a model to understand your cloud spend? Yeah, so the, the data that you'll get, and Mike, I'll pass you here in a minute to get your, your take on how you started with it, but the, the data that you get, right, when you say PDF, yeah, that may be your invoice, which is the PDF of, of billing at the end, which is going to be rolled up to a service level and maybe some number of dozens of pages, but the underlying data, the granular detail of the individual resources in Google, it's the BigQuery export and AWS, it's the cost of usage report. That data can be 
hundreds of millions or billions of individual charges for a large company at scale uh, in cloud. So the, the challenge steps back a bit to not even be, you know, can you start to understand this, but can you even open and use the data? Like a lot of companies need to use the cloud in order to open the cloud bill in order to get insights out of it. So how did you all approach it, Mike, as you start getting into that more detail? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when I started the cloud bill for us was, you know, a couple of million lines and, and today we're in the billions of lines. And so the complexity of that is we've, we've been asking for more detail as practitioners over the years because we need more detail in order to get the, the granularity, in order to understand the cost and also to allocate those costs out to teams. That's a sort of a, a double-edged sword there where we ask for the detail, you get the detail, the detail then adds to those little billing lines and really expands out the, the breadth and depth of the data. But the benefit of having that level of detail is you are able to individually identify nearly every cloud resource individually that's costing you money every hour and allocate it through to Teams. Now, there's a decision between chargeback and showback, and this seems to be really driven by the choice of the company. Some companies like to have a central budget of IT, and so they really do charge it to a central location. And the benefit there would be for showback to be able to allow the teams that are causing that spend to be able to still see the impact of their, their decisions without having to worry about distributing you know, budgets out to teams that no, you know, previously hadn't had that, that experience. For companies that have already got distributed budgets across the organization, then it becomes really important that they get the cost from this central bill in the PDF, as you put it, out to those teams' budgets so that they're actually reflected at the right places on the P&L. So it's really the decision between chargeback and showback is an org level, usually finance team level decision. But the, the value you get of either is the same thing, which is the right, the teams that are actually driving the spend are able to actually see that and, and put that back to those decisions they're making. Is is that cost increase or the, the the change we made last week actually worth that much money or should we be thinking about rolling it back? Or does that actually land where we thought it was going to land in, you know, in costs? So, you know, th- there's a whole pile of next layer challenges you get with things like shared services and that, but showback and chargeback is, is very key to that surfacing the cost to the right teams at the right time. Do you have an example where either chargeback showback has resulted in better utilization that you can share? Yeah, so I think we talk about the Prius effect. So effectively, the idea here is is that when you surface the costs to a team, that they they naturally want to optimize that anyway. So you know the Prius effect sort of talks about the transition from the. You know, 1970s car that's guzzling gas down the freeway in order for you to figure out the efficiency you kind of wait until you run out of petrol and then you can back calculate the the miles that you got on the tank you go to a more modern electric vehicle it tells you that immediately on the dashboard sort of the exact amount of kilowatts that are coming out of the battery and what usually tends to happen is people just drive more efficiently just because they're being made aware of of the impact of their driving and it's it's easier for them to make those choices as they're making it. Do, do I really want to put the foot down because I'm running late or do I? am I okay to take a second longer and uh, be more efficient? And so the same sort of thing happens with, with engineering teams that if they're aware of the cost impacts of those decisions, then naturally they will adjust the decisions they're making and correct the decisions they've made based on that feedback loop. And so the tighter you can get that between the decision they've made and the time they are able to be informed on it, the quicker they can identify the driver of, of the cost changes and, and adjust as needed. And so, yeah, we definitely feel like this is one of the real key points f- for that near, near real-timeness and why having a chargeback showback model combined with that, that fast feedback loop really helps with driving efficiency for, for engineering. Do you think that sometimes if you react too quickly to seeing what your spend is and maybe you reduce your instance size or maybe you make some modifications... Does that lead to problems with respect to peak periods where you have massive loads? How do teams deal with that? Or when you start showing teams what they're spending, how do you prevent them from taking actions that might be detrimental to the business itself? I think this comes down to cloud experience. Like your engineering teams will need to understand their workloads in cloud, not just the point in time, what the workload looks like right this hour, but what it looks like over time. And I I feel like this is just a standard SRE reliability problem even if you take cost out of the picture, you know, they're going to look at ways that they scale up, is scale up times fast enough? Do they have enough capacity to, to be able to scale up to the right sizes for, for the peak workloads? Really, I think this is that sort of handhold where it, it is on the engineers to help us 
pick where they can they can be more efficient but also it's on them to to sort of balance between good and fast and cheap so we call this the iron triangle and it's it's effectively like you can spend more and make a really good really fast really reliable service or you can spend less and make some compromises in those elements so you might be having you know only two az's not three or you might be only running in one region and not two and it's really on each of those services that you're running for your business to, to balance which of those you're going to invest heavier in and which ones is actually okay. Do it, does it need to be fault tolerant or can it just be highly available because it's an in internal service or a lower tier service? So that balance really is, it's up to engineering teams to learn this um, experience and make sure that they're thinking about that balance between good, fast and cheap. There's a nice intersection with SRE performance and all of that, like you said. I want to talk about the organization structure and what your business actually sells, right? So you might have a product that is running and you have to have infrastructure to run that. Maybe you're a company that has multiple product lines that have shared services. How does the chargeback showback model work in that sort of a model where you have different products that have their own infrastructure requirements and you also have these shared services that different products end up using, right? Maybe there's a log storage thing or something like that. So how do those companies account for those shared costs and how does the chargeback or showback model work in that sort of a situation? Yeah, so the, I guess with the the difference between a single product company and a multi-product company, I think that that's a, a nice banner to put over top of things. But the reality is, is as more and more engineering moves towards microservices, even the single product teams have many different services running internally. Some of those will be to support the internal reporting, like you say, logging, observability infrastructure. Some of them will be there to run the actual production service you're offering. And then in the multi-product companies, you have multiple products that are aligned and sh sharing services between them, or you might have actually separate arms of the business, one running the, the distribution center and one running delivery centers and stuff like that. So the idea that there are some companies out there with just the simple one thing in the cloud, it's only ever short-lived because as you do more and more business, more and more of your business in cloud, you end up with this sort of complex mix of things. And then, so that then gets us to the whole shared resources or shared services. And so you kind of, I feel, put them into two separate buckets. There's like a single cloud resource that's being shared and a group of cloud resources being shared. And more often than not, you end up the group. So if you think of something like a Kubernetes cluster, you end up with more than one instance, you know, many storage volumes, load balances. You have all these sort of cloud resources. So the first part of shared, shared service cost reporting is to first identify what is the thing you're sharing as a cloud resources set. And so that's where your tagging and account strategies are going to come in, making sure you're putting all the things in, in a project or in a subscription in order for you to identify the, the thing you're sharing amongst your teams. And then the, the thing the cloud service provider can't give you in the billing data is what's, what is on those, those shared resources. So it, within a Kubernetes clusters, who are the teams that are running particular workloads? And so that, that's then when you come into what we call the proportion data. And so this is something you collaborate with, with the teams that are running those shared resources or shared services to try and get that extra layer of data that you need from them to understand which teams are using how much of that shared resource over time. And then the two pieces together, the cloud bill with the collection of cloud resources in identifying what you're trying to share. And then that proportion data saying which teams to give the cost of that much of the infrastructure to. And by doing that, you're able to then take a, you know, a large cloud spend that is being shared across potentially hundreds of teams and actually break that out and show those teams or even charge back to those teams the individual cloud costs for those resources. And this shared service issue is it's one of the main challenges that we see out there in terms of getting to the full allocation, getting to forecasting and getting accountability out there. You know, Mike mentioned Kubernetes as an example. You know, it's, it's not just shared services, it's layers of virtualization, right, that are being split out. And cloud is one layer of virtualization, Kubernetes is another on top of that. And so we, we do see that as being a big hole in early stage practices, which is not properly accounting for those. And then ultimately something that, you know, a lot of effort is put into. I, I think he talked about the proportional split of the spend. I mean, ultimately where that allocation of spend is heading toward is, is also then measuring the proportional output that each one is getting, right? Like what activity is it actually generating? Ultimately, maybe even what revenue is it driving? You know, what what, what is the, and that's kind of the whole point of this whole practice, right? Is 
okay, so let's not just look at what we're spending in cloud, but let's look at the value that's coming back out on the other end from that, from that shared service so that we can start to, you know, make some trade-off decisions. Mike mentioned the iron triangle. Spending more isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you are trying to get better performance, if you're trying to drive more customers, if you're trying to deliver, you know, more features and more innovation. So getting that shared services in place, you know, I, I think or the reporting of it is is really key, right, to getting the larger um, bit in place for allocating and showing back to get to that unit economic view of things. You both mentioned about tagging in accounts. So can you maybe dig into that a little bit to say what options are available to be able to group your utilization into your business unit, into your products, into your teams, et cetera. How do you enforce that? How do you set that cultural expectation maybe to be able to, at a later point, look and attribute your resource utilization? Yeah, so I guess the most granular weapon in in the process there is that the account level hierarchy, so your accounts, your subscriptions, your projects, that sort of larger cloud resource, like a cloud account that you're putting your resources within. And so you're wanting to sort of define a strategy around those that allows you to sort of at a granular level, understand the infrastructure that goes inside. So the obvious ones are dev, stage, and prod, right? You're, you're not sort of mixing the, the three together in one project or whatever. Then with inside that, you'll probably end up with multiple of something. So di- two different services or four or five shards of a sim- single service. You want to be able to identify which of those cloud resources are part of which piece. And so that's where your tags and labels come in to, to sort of start to separate the two. With tags and labels, you've got a lot more, more granularity. You can put a lot of those on cloud resources, obviously with that balance of trying to get them done properly by your teams, which we'll get to in a second. That tag and label really is the sort of the more granular piece. So you're taking that large, the sort of real coarse grain account level and then getting down to those granular level tags and accounts. And then the combination of the two Lastly, there's what we call a synthetic tag. So when we get the cloud bill in, we're using detail in that cloud bill with some external lookup, some extra piece of data. And so this is where you are getting a lot of the CMDBs type lookups happening where we're bringing in extra information we know. So we're using one key piece of information, maybe like the service name of a cloud resource to pull in extra data after the fact into the cloud bill. And that gives you even more granularity to the details about individual cloud resources. The the trick there obviously is to make sure that your teams are building their resources in the right cloud accounts and are tagging and labeling, which you mentioned. And so there's sort of, I guess there's sort of three approaches that we see to that. There's the control of what can be done. And and we're starting to see the CSPs, the cloud service providers now offer more features around preventing the creation of resources without the right tags and tag values. Now these are, they're not perfect. It's not a perfect silver bullet today. You know, there's only certain ways you can describe particular characteristics of that. And potentially that would impact existing running deployments, et cetera, in your, in your environment. So it's not an easy switch to turn on, but it is a great area for you to start to put some controls around tagging and labeling. After that, then you have the sort of remediation type tools that come in and they might stop cloud resources if they're not tagged correctly, or you know we see that sort of going towards deletion of cloud resources. And that sort of, that's really a hard one for, for some companies to take on, especially if you know that it potentially could delete real production stuff. And so there's an adoption curve of that sort of control after the fact. And then the lastly, which is the more software approach, which is just to at least report upon two teams where they are tagged correctly, where they're not tagged correctly and having allocation methods that handle for untagged resources so that you know when it's not tagged, this is how it's handled, that it, uh, uh, someone will ultimately end up responsible for it. it. You know, when you end up with no sort of remediation action at the end, you end up with a lot of costs that just fall in a hole mm-hmm. when no one's paying attention to them. And that's worse than just having a, you know, a fairly crude allocation mecca that would give it to somebody to care about. You know, usually once you tell somebody that they're getting cloud costs that are not theirs, mm-hmm. they usually want to figure out who's, who's are they and get them allocated to them properly. So you're sort of distributing that, that pain point of unallocated costs. I guess the clarity around your spending improves over time to a point where you have very fine processes in place to always attribute correctly, catch attributions that are not present for whatever reason. I want to just dig into one other point you mentioned was the challenges with tagging labeling with respect to virtualization. When you have another layer of virtualization like Kubernetes that's orchestrating your containers, that's running in different machines that are already virtualized, can you 
talk a little bit about what is the challenge there and what do you recommend that teams and companies can do in those situations? The funny thing with Kubernetes is it's it's kind of a cloud on top of a cloud and you end up applying all the same FinOps practices again to the layer above. And so you start to then think about namespaces just like you thought about cloud accounts, you know, your projects as projects and subscriptions. That's your namespace. And within the namespace, you can then label the pods and they're kind of your, your parallel to the tags that you had within the cloud resources above. And so you can kind of apply yet again the same course and, and fine grain allocation strategies that you had at the raw cloud account into the Kubernetes environment. I guess a well-written tagging labeling strategy or policy within your organization can almost be just completely translated straight one for one into the Kubernetes land. And then you can apply very similar sort of things like you prevent pods from starting unless they've got the right labels. You can you know, stop or, or you know terminate pods that don't have the correct labeling. So you can almost apply all the same strategies that you had at the cloud layer again on the Kubernetes. When you go over away from something like Kubernetes into to other things like EMR jobs or shared database layers, potentially similar sorts of things, but you know, you you might be able to tag and label or to namespace particular things. Is the metering of your usage that could be done in one way for on the cloud provider, whereas Kubernetes might meter and tell you how much you're using for a particular pod container or whatever in a different way. So does that translate well when you apply the same tags and labels across both sites? Yeah, so I guess the, the tags and labels really just identify the, the workload itself. So whether it's raw on the cloud account or within something like Kubernetes pod, to figure out which is which. The metering of which is important for your proportioning is really driven by the, the workloads themselves. Some might be very CPU intensive, and so you're really wanting to use that measure as far as what is the impact. So if you're finding that you've got very low CPU pods, but they're using a lot of memory, that's probably going to be your driver. The more of those you need, the more cloud underlying cloud resources that are needing to be provisioned. So it's really trying to identify what is the driving element of the workload and then using that to measure. We've seen workloads that are driven mostly by network activity, large amounts of network activity, very little amount of CPU. And so you kind of, to, for those, you're starting to look at how much of the network capacity is it using as a, as a proportion of the, the cluster. And so, yeah, I think it really, you can't have one sort of silver bullet that does them all. It's kind of really looking at workload specific, what is the driving element. And the, the principles are the same within a container world. In some ways, it's like a, it's another little FinOps cycle that happens within containers, right? You asked about the allocation strategies, you know, instead of allocating that to tags and instead of allocating, you know, to projects and Google and those things, yeah, you are allocating to namespaces and, you know, you're looking at, at labeling in the, within the container system. But then you also have the same issue. We talked about shared costs of allocating out not only the use of the containers themselves, but also like unused portions of it, right? And there, there's, you add another layer of right sizing has to happen within, you know, the containers themselves, within the cluster, you know, what hardware that cluster is sitting on. And there's sort of recursive layers of this. And, and that becomes an interesting organizational challenge because again, you're distributing duty, duties rather between different people, right? There might be one group managing the containers and the cluster, another managing infrastructure in some cases, another who's managing the commitments to the cloud providers that are running the resources that are running all these things. And so you've got to loop through all of those, right? And, and sort of start at, again, where is the spend going within the containers? And then how are we using the right amount of it? And then can we get a better rate for that, which we are using? And then be constantly communicating that out in that real-time feedback loop so that you're you're not doing these big, hey, we see spend is really off and we need to cut down and make changes. You're doing constant iterative iterations. To Mike's earlier point of continuing to the cycle constantly and regularly. Mm -hmm. I want to switch gears into what comes after being in this informed phase where you have a mature information reporting strategy where you can charge back, show back to various business units, engineering teams, what they're using. So the next real thing is optimization. And in the book, you talk about two different levers that are generally available for optimizing. Can you talk about what they are? And then we'll dig into them. Yeah, so the, the two levers or, or levers are essentially paying or using less, which is your usage optimization lever, and then paying less, which is your rate optimization lever. And th there's no, no, no magic here and, and kind of like everything else, there's, there's a usage quantity and a rate quantity. But what's different in FinOps world is really, I think, 
who is responsible for those and the fact that it is so distributed. Historically, folks, when they're starting to jump into FinOps, they think pretty much immediately, you even mentioned it earlier, right-sizing. Right? I, I, want, I, want I want to right-size the, the thing to do the, the job that it's, it's needing to be done. That's a really important you know, lever to pull in terms of, you know, say, a compute resource and getting the right-size instance against that. But you kind of want to go back before that to say, hey, I, how do I just turn off things that you know, aren't being used at all, right? There's a, there's a shutting those down. That type of work, that usage optimization work, really is best done by the engineering teams and the operations teams who are responsible for that infrastructure and understand how those changes may impact performance down the road. So very much in FinOps, we want to push the data out to those teams to think about where they potentially use less. On the other side of that, there's the how do we pay less for what we have used uh, or are using. And that's really the rate optimization piece tends to live in the more advanced practices within a centralized FinOps team who is looking across the entire cloud estate, the entire cloud infrastructure to figure out how to make broad commitments to a cloud provider. Hey, we think we're going to use about this much in the coming year. So we're going to work with the cloud provider around a commitment there. And are in the microcosm looking to say, hey, this team is using this much of this particular resource. Let's make a one or three year commitment via reserved instance or a savings plan. And what's interesting there about that, that second lever is that we, we do see it uh, centralized very often because, you know, the teams who are, who are deploying resources and writing code, you know, are trying to right size or optimize the usage. They're not often thinking about those financial commitments to the cloud provider. And, and frankly, sometimes they're afraid to say, yeah, I'm going to use, I'm doing air quotes, you know, this resource for the next year or three years. Because they're looking at cloud as something that they may want to use the latest resource type or they may want to use a new service that's come out. Whereas a central team who's responsible for the entire organization's spend can say, yeah, you know, generally as an organization, we're using this many thousands or millions of dollars a month within this cloud provider across lots of different teams that may be changing what they're doing constantly. So we're comfortable as a larger organization committing to this amount of this type of resource or this amount of spend. And so those two things obviously are very closely interconnected. As you get into things like forecasting of spend, it gets even more complicated because you have to start to you know, think about scenario modeling around not only what you're using, but if this team makes this optimization to the usage, how does that affect our commitments to the cloud provider? And those commitments affect the rates, which obviously affect you know, how much you're going to spend over time. So it's a fine dance between the two. One of the things that we often get asked as well is which of those levers should you should pull first, right? Should you optimize the usage or should you optimize the rates? And, and people commonly say, well, of course you want to optimize the usage. I want, I want to turn off things I'm not using. I want to size down things that are too large. Why would I make any commitments to the cloud provider before I do that? And unfortunately, the, the, <laughs> the stark reality of the, the case often is that the, those changes to the infrastructure can take a lot of time and a lot of effort by engineering operations teams. And often the, the right approach is, is really to start making commitments while you're optimizing usage, right, to commit to reserve instances, save, savings plans, those things, so that in parallel, you can be optimizing your usage efficiency while you're getting better rates for what you're already using. In terms of right-sizing, there are these developments with serverless offerings, right? Where you're constantly only paying for what you use rather than predicting what you might need on a box and then using it mostly at some fixed capacity most of the time. So how does that impact your general forecasting or understanding of cloud spend? Does it make it easier? Does it complicate things for the FinOps journey? Some people see serverless as some like solution to not needing to right size. And the reality of it is, is that you're still sizing your serverless. You know, whether it's a function as a service, you're picking a memory or CPU commitment that you're getting for that function. Or if it's a, you know, serverless based container orchestration like EKS or any of the Kubernetes or ECS services, you're sizing those pods. And so you're making some form of size commitment, even with the serverless in most cases. And so you didn't really avoid the right sizing. You've just changed the, the sort of how it's sized from being a you know size of a C, EC2 instance or a VM instance to really the size of the, the serverless commitment you're making. I think once you often the sort of right sizing for serverless is put on the lower priority because for the vast majority of cloud spenders, it's VM instances, managed databases, and object storage that are like your three big items. And so serverless usually is a, way down the list as far as uh, co cost goes on your bill 
But I think that as we see more and more companies lean heavier into serverless, it will start to become more of a cost item on their bill and, and right-sizing serverless workloads will start to become way more popular because you know it becomes more and more predominant in their cloud bill. And then as far as predicting though, like I think... The good thing about serverless is you run a lot of it. Like it's your big cloud spenders would be running tens, if not hundreds of thousands of EC2 instances. When you run enough of them, you end up with this sort of like very stable base load amount of. With serverless, you're because it's such a small individual element, even small cloud consumers using serverless use a lot of serverless. And so you end up with that base load very quickly anyway. And so predicting the workloads on serverless, I think will become easier because you'll end up with lots of teams doing lots of different things with serverless, but in aggregate, a fairly stable base load. There's going to be huge spikes at periods, but you kind of end up with this, like if you think about sort of a sine wave and then a second sine wave phase sort of phase shifted, while one team is using a lot, another team is using less, and then while that they they're using a lot, the other ones, and so you sort of end up with this sort of like noise all canceling out, and sort of this like f- sort of hum, if you will, of the cloud spend ticking along. So, but yeah, like the, it's interesting. That in, I think it will be interesting as more and more teams become more cloud native with cloud, adopting more and more of these serverless things to how that story story fleshes out over the next couple of years. Yeah, that makes sense about how they might normalize out depending on time of day and different services. We talked earlier about different organizations having shared services or rather everyone's looking at microservices and how lots of resources are in fact shared. In terms of rate optimization, how do you go about getting the number of reserved instances or getting a committed usage discount from a cloud provider and then applying it back into the actual products or the actual needs of the infrastructure. How does how do you map that into individual products and resources? Yeah, this is a, an interesting challenge. It's different at various stages of maturity, right? So early on, the challenge when you're starting finance practice is you're you're beginning to make commitments to the cloud provider for reserved instance capacity or savings bond capacity, and it's a small percentage of your total spend. And what companies end up with is a big deviation between the on-demand spend and what you're paying for that and the covered or reserved spend and what you're paying there. And one of the challenges across most of the cloud providers is you generally can't really dictate where those savings are applied. They're applied to a certain type of resource in a certain region, but you can't say this particular resource. And they're not really meant to be tied to an individual resource. They're meant to be tied to a type of spend. And so early on, there can be big differences in how an individual team sees their spending because they're either getting that discount or not. And longer term though, as you get to a a very large scale of of good coverage in those areas, and let's say, you know, 90% of your coverable resources are covered, the the challenge changes a bit, which is that you're kind of, instead of having to figure out who's going to get it, who's not, you're trying to figure out, can you cover that last remaining bit, right? To get them to the next level of, of discounting. And so yeah, it's, I mean, it's a hard problem. You've been through years of it, Mike. How have you sort of seen it evolve? Yeah, for the most part, I think that, the, as you say, the higher level coverage gives us a fairly stable rate that teams can then sort of trust upon. But there, there is times where particular workloads really kind of miss out on being the one that gets covered. And that's often the case with things like savings plans. They often want to discount the, the highest return items first. So you've got teams that are kind of running those smaller size instances, potentially in, in the more common regions. And so they end up kind of being the team that always misses out. And so they're, they're, this conversation of reallocating the savings does come up from time to time. I know that there's vent tooling in this space from, from third-party vendors that can help you reallocate some of the savings. One of the approaches we, I've taken previously is we we actually scrape back all of the savings from a particular product line and then reallocate the, the dollars on budget lines as we want to apply it as a sort of more you know, more fair system, if you will. And then I have seen in-house tooling being built by some of our our best, most advanced practitioners that will reshuffle and allocate these RIs to different teams as they needed. So it's really just comes down to the, the amount of importance that it is that the RI savings hits the right team. So the materiality of that, and then the amount of effort you really want to put into reallocating that saving for that particular area of the business. In the most part, with a higher level coverage, you end up with just the small sort of pockets not not getting the right benefit. And you might be able to just adjust that with some uh, added budget in that business unit, that sort of thing. Increasingly, we're seeing a trend as well where some of the more advanced 
the FinOps practices are actually not even paying attention to where the discount is being applied and are setting essentially their internal rates of we're, we're managing that coverage of commitment centrally. And if you use this type of resources, we're going to give you this type of rate for it. And then they're, as Mike said, sometimes they're shuffling them behind the scenes or they're doing kind of a second set of books. There's the actual cloud billing data and then there's how that's allocated internally. And whether that's the right approach or, or wrong, it presents a different set of challenges. I presume the second set of books kind of counts for normalizing the cost across different teams. For example, if I'm a team it does. that happens to get like reserved instances or discounted instances all the time, my total spend looks lower than it should be, right? So going back into the inform phase of understanding where you're spending and how much you're spending, your second rate of books that you just mentioned is is that the reason being that you can normalize the actual cost of the underlying resource across different rates applied to the exact same instance type or yeah. service that you're buying. And if you think about that feedback loop and the Prius effect that Mike mentioned, it's much more effective when you see spend that you can influence and that you know that your action is going to change that, right? Because, and so we're seeing a lot of these companies that are doing this second set of books say, well, in consumer of cloud engineering team, don't worry about what rate you potentially are going to get. Just focus on using the right amount, that first lever, and then we'll get you the best possible rates for that. And it it, it removes this, this scenario that happens a lot, unfortunately, in those earlier stages of adoption where one day a team gets a reserve instance assigned and their prices are low, and then they shut down a resource. And while they have it shut down, another team picks up that discount. It goes to the other team. They bring a resource back online, and suddenly their, their rates have gone up. And they say, "Well, I haven't, I haven't changed anything. I'm using maybe I may even be using smaller resources or fewer resources, and my bill has gone up." And so that's why we're seeing that move towards separating those out. This becomes really important for things like MSPs that that want to have a standard, stable rate for the the what the services they're charging out to their customer base. And you see tools like Amazon Billing Conductor are sort of really supporting this model of sort of standardizing the rates that presented within the billing data and sort of in italics hiding the savings in order for you to sort of allocate them yourself where you, where you need it. It's interesting that everyone is working towards that sort of common understanding of where your spend is going. It's not just from your end, but it's also from the cloud providers that are assisting and evolving their billing data to suit this sort of like allocation. Once you're in this journey where you have your information necessary, you have the optimizations, you understand what you can do. You talk about just the operational phase, like where you operate with this framework. Can you Talk about what sort of advanced strategies and techniques exist once you are past the initial set of low-hanging fruits to move towards a more sound financial operating strategy for the cloud. Yeah, like the the ultimate goal that we see for FinOps is to get into that data-driven decision-making. And so there's a whole pile of different capabilities within FinOps that can kind of deliver you towards that ultimate goal of decision-making. And we've covered a lot of the sort of the bread and butter capabilities. Today, we've mentioned forecasting a couple of times. It's also another really important one, which often connects with budgeting. But integration with other frameworks is also really important for, for FinOps to fully settle into the business and, and sort of mesh well with the existing practices that are there. But ultimately, yeah, like if FinOps has done well, engineers don't see FinOps as as an added task. It's not oil and water. It's It's just mixed into the way they think about cloud. And the way that they're making their decisions and getting that feedback loop happening is almost a natural behavior for engineering. So there's a whole pile of capabilities that we cover in the FinOps framework on the FinOps.org website that really sort of cover each of those areas and what they look like at a, at a starting phase for each of those capabilities right through to advanced, what we're seeing as an advanced practitioner uh, out in the field. And so the capabilities aren't really a checklist. They're more like a, a menu of items that you can pick to build the right practice for the right organization. And I think the the first early days of, of FinOps really lived in a world where FinOps was in a bubble. It was billing data, spend data that was really organizations or people in the organization had to go find and they had to go look for and they had to think about it. Oh, our costs are up. I need to go check this out. And, and where it's moved for more advanced organizations is that you know, the data of FinOps is in the path of the engineers. It's in the path of the executives. It's in the path of everyone who needs it. So it's not outside their workflow. And this manifests in a tangible basis in 
taking FinOps and cost-related data and putting it into engineering tools, into Grafana where they're looking, into Jira where they're collecting and planning sprints, into wherever they're working. And the other side of that also is starting to integrate in other data with, and Mike mentioned, intersection with other frameworks, integrating in other types of data, revenue data, business output data, all of those things. Because Cost data on its own is really hard for folks to, I think, understand when, when you're dealing with an organization that may be spending millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in technology spend, what is the right amount of spend? How much is too much or too little? And so you really want to get into a place where you're combining that with other business data to give context to that information. And then making sure, as we talked about, it's early on in the process. Oddly, the most advanced organizations, what they're doing is nothing magical, but they're they're considering FinOps data at the beginning of the architectural design process rather than the end, right? And that's letting them actually make an effect change throughout that process. And they're not asking engineers to go out of their workflows and they're they're aligned in in their outputs to say, yeah, we're, we're going to make decisions about costs that ultimately are going to result in better outcomes at all stages of the process, rather than trying to, to wedge in last minute a change that's going to reduce costs and may have a negative impact on business outcomes. I want to just wrap up with one thing, but I think you touched upon this already in your previous response, but what are the right cultural expectations that you can set as a business leader? What not to do in terms of controlling, understanding, and optimizing your cloud spend? Any last closing thoughts on that for leaders to set that expectation, set that cultural workflow in, in terms of having a sound FinOps strategy? I've got one I can start with, Mike, and then I'll give one to you. But for me, one of the big differences we saw from the first version of the Cloud FinOps book to the second one, and after a couple of years of looking at it, was just how often people who are new to the practice and in the early days of this, they would go to engineering teams and sort of be blaming them. They would be an us versus them approach of, you need to cut costs, you're being wasteful, here's all these recommendations to save money. You're not doing your job. And that immediately puts an engineer or anybody on their back foot and makes them want to push back and, and, and disagree and have an argument. And the, the really advanced and successful folks are, are just using basic human motivation skills to partner right in the organization, to, to come in with, with data, to have a conversation, to say, hey, how can I help look at this with you and come to the best outcome on their own? And, and I think that's, that's really the most important learning from seeing a lot of folks fail at it. Yeah, I agree. maybe to put a bit of a spin on it, thinking about sort of economic outlooks and, and potential downturns and stuff like that, it'd be easy for CTO leaders to set that tone for their engineering teams to go and solve the cost problem or, you know, go reduce spend. And you end up with a lot of people moving a lot of bricks all at the same time. And you don't know if you're building a better cloud or you're actually making it worse. And so really, I feel like just understanding that this is a, like JR says, it's a partnership, it's a collaboration between teams. So everybody is building towards the same awesome outcome for the organization and you don't end up with everybody trying to help without talking to each other. I think that if there's just a tendency for not so much like a role separation, but more everyone understands their role they play and they all want to play together in the same sandpit that really helps drive a good outcomes for the, for the business. Great. Thank you so much, JR and Mike, for coming on the show and talking about Cloud FinOps. This was really nice and informative to understand how and what not to do with respect to cloud spending. This is Akshay Manchale for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other 